Hello, and welcome to the first and perhaps only episode of the Constellations podcast, where we'll be discussing the constellations within us, a fic set after season three of Lego Monkey Kid, which is basically an AU that has spiraled out of control and taken over my life. So we have a few questions from various people, but they're all anonymous, so I don't really know who these people are, but we're just going to go down the list of questions that they have about the fic, about the AU, about characterization and all those things that people are curious about. Um, But before we dive into it, I want to just extend a thank you for showing interest for reading the fic in the first place, for spreading it around, for talking to other people about it, and for leaving really great comments and tags about your experience reading and what you liked about it, your favorite parts. All that stuff really helps me to put my best work forward and helps me know what works and what doesn't. So I really appreciate all that feedback. And for people who have been reading the fic since chapter one and just commenting every chapter, you mean the world to me because this would not (laughs) have happened otherwise. (laughs) So thank you so much. I've been getting a lot of support and I really appreciate it because we're almost done and I'm so excited. (laughs) And just thank you for being along on the journey because it's been a long ass journey. I know it's only been like what, five months, four months? It's fucking been six to me because I was planning all this out. So let's jump right into it. Um, so I wanted to start with um, an ask that I got about Macaque committing a murder or a revenge murder against Wukong. And it was one that I got before chapter four was posted and I asked the person who sent it to send it again after chapter four had been out for a while because, you know, chapter four is just so heavy and it has all these emotions and everything comes to light. So after chapter four, would Macaque be messed up if he killed Wukong, like after chapter four? And the answer I have to that is I don't think he would... I don't think he would kill Wukong after chapter four. I think that there's most of the emotion was the abandonment for Macaque, like the knowledge or the thought that he had been abandoned for such a long time that Wukong didn't look into where he was. You know, he wasn't curious about him. He didn't think about him. Like all that really messed up Macaque. And he's like, now that he knows that Wukong was suffering himself and that he did not have any clue that Macaque was in hell and being tortured and what happened to him, he had no idea about the curse and all that. I think that just, well, it does fundamentally change Macaque's perspective. So he would be like, now that I have all this additional context to the situation, I'm just going to reevaluate. And after reevaluating, the, you know, the thing that he's most upset about now is, you know, being killed. And it's like, when we put that by itself into context, we see why Wukong was so angry at that point. And Macaque sees that now too, after chapter four, he's like, Wukong was so angry at me because he thought that I forgot about him and that I, I literally wasn't there when I said I would be. And he used the gift he used the gift that I gave him specifically crafted for a situation like the one he was in. And he actually used it smartly and it didn't work out. So, you know, that's, you know, that really fucked Wukong up because he's like, I I literally waited for the perfect time to use this eternal night and you didn't come. And that's fucked up. And Macaque knows that's fucked up. And I think he has a little bit more of an understanding as to why Wukong was mad at him and how, he like understands how they got to that point. So I don't think he would do a murder to Wukong after chapter four. He would not do that. I'm not saying that he doesn't think about it. And I'm not saying he doesn't consider it. I'm saying that he would not go through with it. Um, But I do think he would probably do some torture, (laughs) you know, just for 
just more of the stuff he's been doing and probably a little bit more like he would do a lot of like oh you know torment some just torture maybe death visions just pain you know that kind of stuff I think he would want to do that but I think you know chapter four was just so much and the characters are just fundamentally changing like their brains and the way that they're thinking about this has changed in such a fundamental way that even to me it's hard for me to be like oh this is definitely what macaque would do because it's like they're kind of in a space where they're heavily influenced by what happens next like i don't know how to explain it but it's like from conversation to conversation their feelings change so it's like they've they're in this like turbulent kind of loopy weird area where they're not sure of themselves and it's like at the end of the mirror scene where they're like oh what do you wukong's like what do you say do you want to do this it's kind of like that still they're like oh i don't know if i want to do this or so they're taking it like step by step so it's really hard for me to be like what would mccag do but i do think he would like do some torture (laughs) and he would like make wukong's life hell at some points, not all the time, but like if Wukong did something or said something or, you know, I don't know, was rude about it. He wouldn't be rude about the murder, but he doesn't forgive him completely. He understands why things happen, but he's still mad that he got killed in the first place. Like he's just mad that Wukong did that and could do that. Even if he knows that Wukong thought he was immortal, even if he understands that Wukong's like final blow wouldn't have killed him if he was immortal still he knows that but it's like it still happened you know he still did it and it's it that just really fucks him up i think even though he has this but this context ha- helps him like see where wukong is coming from but i still think of course he still has this anger inside and he's now we're trying to work through that so it's like i think that he would like actually be a little asshole about it and you know there would probably still be times where he does get really angry and takes that out on wukong and lashes out because you know he got killed (laughs) so i mean it's not 100 percent perfect but i do not think he would i don't think he would go through with killing him after chapter four chapter three absolutely chapter four (laughs) uh he wouldn't do that he wouldn't do that he would just you know make him suffer periodically (laughs) you know every six months he's like oh time for your (laughs) time for your suffering routine wukong here i am to make your life hell and then i'll see you again in six months kind of that type of thing i know that's weird i don't think i'm explaining it right but like he would not go through with the whole murder thing and i think that will show itself in chapter five you'll see how macaque is like really rethinking this and rethinking his position on it like he's just taking everything and just he's just having a whole hard time because that was his whole thing like Pete that's you know he was resurrected and that was his goal was just to get revenge you know and now that he has this information he's like oh shit that's why in chapter four he's like I don't even know if I belong here it feels like I don't I don't belong I don't belong this time period I don't belong in this place I'm not supposed to be here. Like, (laughs) he has this kind of, like, existential crisis because it's like, when you reevaluate everything, you reevaluate your place in the world. So he's like, okay, now that I have all this context, I see that I'm not, this isn't, I'm, it's not right. But it's like, Wukong reassuring him that they were never right is super important because they never were. So, you know, that's kind of like how up in the air Wukong and well Wukong's not as up in the air (laughs) obviously but Macaque is up in the air with his feelings so he would not kill Wukong post chapter four that was a really long answer to that question but that is the answer sorry I think that took like 20 minutes um the next question it was uh, um it's regarding like the abandonment in constellations and how like Um, how the abandonment is important to macaque and how like their whole like the comparison between abandonment in canon and abandonment in this au and like how macaque's biggest problem with wukong according to this ask was the 
abandonment of thinking that Wukong abandoned him to be tortured and didn't like come save him or anything like that and how that matches what happens in canon where macaque is constantly like well you left me you abandoned me you know in canon where he's like wukong left me and went off on his own you know abandonment is core to macaque's backstory and his whole issue with wukong that um when i was planning this au i knew that that had to be like important that had to abandonment had to be part of their backstory because I want it not only did I want it to be as close to canon as possible and just diverge you know a little bit I wanted it to like focus on those same core themes of abandonment and like uh the hero and the warrior and like fighting and like what their relationship was like I wanted to keep those same emotions so abandonment is really important and this user talks about how once they cleared the air about how they didn't abandon each other the tone of chapter four changed and that is true because that was like the big that was the big thing that they needed to get through in order to confront like everything else like they couldn't get anywhere else unless they talked about that first so and you can see by just the beginning of the mirror scene how macaque is like oh You know, you didn't care about me. You didn't look for me. You didn't think about me, probably. You were just focused on your journey and your companions. And he just doesn't have the context of the journey. And he just doesn't know, you know, all these details about how Wukong was forced and how, you know, he could leave, but not for extended periods of time. So it's not like he could, like, go on a search (laughs) for Macaque all over the country or whatever. So, you know, he, Macaque just assumes all these things. But the abandonment was the big part of it because he really just felt forgotten and he just felt like he didn't matter to Wukong. And when you add in the whole, they were mates before and they made vows to each other and they like loved each other deeply. On top of that, the abandonment gets, it's even more, it's even more powerful because it's like, they sure did, you know, get married (laughs) and they, you know, were committed to each other. And they had this assurance. He Like, McCann had this assurance. That's why he's like, Wukong, I thought you could do... You were everything to me. I thought you could do anything. Like, he really did believe that. So that's why the abandonment hurts even more. Because he's like... McCann thought, he left me to be tormented and to die over and over. Not die over and over, but to be torn apart. And he could have saved me at any point. Like, he can do anything. Why didn't the Monkey King come save me? He could... He's like literally invincible or whatever, you know? So that just hurt him even more. And it's like working through that was central to the mirror scene and also to them just like working through anything. Like, of course, they both understand the murder was wrong. Like they understand that. But it was the confusion and the miscommunication over the abandonment that was in, that was important. And it was just like... Wukong also felt abandoned, but he didn't go about it in the same way. And we can see how their characterization differs there because Wukong is just more defensive and angry about it. And he like, not saying that Macaque isn't angry about it, but he like, it's it's just more somber when Macaque does it compared to Wukong who like hides so much of himself. You know, he hides like, all these things all these feelings that he has because he doesn't want to like burden people and he doesn't want to like let people in Macaque doesn't either but it's like Wukong's just been alive for so long and he's just that's how he lives now that he just is like I'm not gonna like express that or tell anybody about it and like Macaque is also feeling that way but he's like as soon as there was like an opportunity like in that mirror scene Macaque is the one that kind of like he's the one who kind of got things forward because he was being honest about his feelings like about being abandoned and forgotten he was being angry about it he was saying it in an angry tone but he was like the one who started that whole thing because he's like talking about the great companions and how they're the most important thing to wukong like he's like letting all those emotions free but he's doing it in his own emotional wake like because he's still composed about it but those emotions are real and they're not as like loud and, you know, expressive 
and exploding as Wukong's are. When Wukong gets expressive and emotional, it's really loud. Like he, when he cries, it's like really, it's like, that's his whole, like it takes up his whole body. It takes every ounce of energy when he cries and when he's angry and when all that happens, you know, he expresses it with his whole body. And with Macaque, it's like really controlled. He's methodical. And I think I said that in the descriptions that he is really calculative with every expression he every bit of emotion that he expresses like he's really like got it down to the wire of like you know so but he did initially start that the whole abandonment and the whole uh conversation that led to them figuring out what happened and yeah he is this ask is like he was way more butthurt about wukong abandoning him and it's like yeah he was because it's like at that point you know after the whole we we're gonna they them failing to like kill the emperor or whatever they were still in like their happy-go-lucky you know we're together kind of honeymoon phase kind of thing and it's like to have all that come crashing down is gonna have a lasting impact that's why it's it was so emotional through the centuries and through the thousands of years it still stayed with them it was so you know disappointing and just to be let down by this person who could do anything and you knew they could do anything you believe that wholeheartedly and then all of a sudden it's like oh they can't they weren't there for me they didn't save me i needed them and they promised me they vowed that they would be there and they weren't the one time i really needed them there and you know the whole time the cat was being tortured he's like wukong is going to come for me i know he's going to come for me he can't hear anything and he can't escape himself so he was just holding on to that hope that Wukong was going to find him and he was going to save him. And it never happened. And so that like stuck with him because he's already being tortured. So that's he's being traumatized. And he's like he has this feeling of abandonment on top of it. And so he and then he like suffers for over 500 years. He comes back. Wukong's got new friends. So, of course, he feels forgotten and like like he's nothing. Like, because Wukong didn't even look for him. He didn't even, you know, it was like, we have to think about that and how that has a lasting impact. The death, of course, was fucked up and it was more fucked up, but it was instant. This abandonment feeling is something Macaque sat with for a while while he was recov while he was recovering and, like, trying to get himself back together. Because as soon as he was out of hell, as soon as they dropped him back off in the mortal realm, he was he was cursed. So every night... He was haunted by those ghosts and he was suffering and he couldn't use strong magic. He could, but he would get haunted. So he was learning the details of this curse while contending with his more mortality while healing because he was being, he had been ripped apart and sewn back together with death magic. So now there's death magic all on his body and he's got scars and stuff. I'll get into that in chapter five. But anyway, he's really fucked up and he was dealing with all that. Wukong didn't look for him or ask, like he, like he wasn't around. So it's like, that is more important. Like it's more, it's the more emotional part of this whole argument is the abandonment. The killing is definitely the worst, you know, cause obviously, but the abandonment, that was a huge thing. And that's why they had to work through that before they could get to anything else. That's also why once um, Wukong brought up Macaque's death, like, I'm sorry that happened to you. There was this switch in Macaque's mind that was like, you know what, I, that's right. Even with all this abandonment, even with him, like, showing affection for Wukong and, like, touching his cheek or whatever, he's like, yeah, you still killed me, though. And that's why he tries to, like, push Wukong away in that instance because he's like I can't forget that he did that even with all this context and all this explanation everything now that I even though I understand now I can't forget that he killed me and there's always a chance from like this point onward that he could hurt me grievously grievously again so he's like I don't want to take that chance and like we could go into <laughs> We could go into the emotions of that because one of when I was talking about that chapter with one of my friends, we were talking about um, the whole Macaque trying to push Wukong away 
and how he like made this big dramatic deal about it. I love how we just snuck, I just snuck in this little like theater reference of Macaque being like, oh, it's, it's over. And how he had to make it this dramatic thing and how Wukong knew that's what he was doing. Like, I like that Wukong could tell that because he knew Macaque so well. He was like, oh, I know what he's, I know what he's planning to do. And he did it. And Wukong's like, fuck this. Like, I like that Macaque was just trying to push Wukong away and get away from him. But the thing is, even though Macaque was trying to do that, that's not what he wanted. And I, you know, I like to think I made that obvious. I might not have. I probably did after the fact, maybe after the second reading people saw, but he he was pushing him away because he was afraid and apprehensive of getting hurt again. But he definitely doesn't want to push Wukong away because that's like one of his, like even like even all this shit that happened between them, that is still his best friend. Like Wukong is still Macaque's best friend. Like who knows him better? Who? Nobody. <laughs> nobody. Nobody in the Brotherhood does. Nobody on the mountain does. Wukong knows him the best. Macaque knows that. Wukong knows that too. Like the fact that they know we, they know each other so well. How are you gonna push away the one person who was who was there, who gets you, who knows you inside and out? Like Wukong knows Macaque more than anybody ever will. And it's the same way that Macaque knows Wukong better than anybody ever will. Better than any of his companions or Tripitaka, sorry, but that's the truth. And like they just know each other too well. They spent too much time together, centuries, centuries, centuries of time together. And they loved each other. So it's like they, you know, they know that. And it's like Macaque trying to push Wukong away was him trying to protect himself from hurt. And the thing is, is that Wukong responded in this earnest way of just pure love and adoration and admiration. And he was his, he just was blatantly honest. And that's exactly what Macaque needed. He needed that sense of love and honesty. He needed to know Wukong's true feelings. He needed to know every everything, every single thing that Wukong said after that was important. And it's what Macaque needed to hear. He needed to hear how important he was. He needed to hear how Wukong was not going to give up on this, how he didn't want to, how he knew that they were supposed to be together. And even though with everything that happened between them, he still thinks that they have a shot and he still wants to give them a shot. So that whole, that's why I think that's my favorite part of chapter four, which is hard because <laughs> I, I actually love chapter four a lot for many reasons. But I think that whole situation where Macaque starts to push him away, I think that part to the end of the mirror arc is my favorite part because I just love how Wu Macak tries to build up these walls and Wukong just knocks each and every one down because he's that determined to make Macaque see that they're supposed to be together. He's that determined. And I think that's just beautiful. Okay, I think that's enough on that one question. That was just one question. And then I went on a tangent, but we have another question. <laughs> um, and this is more technical towards the fic itself and it's about the environmental references I use for each setting um, that I describe in the fic. So um, basically when it comes to settings, what I do is I, when initially planning the fic, what I did was I gave like basic ideas. Like, so in chapter two, it was the um, skyline city and then you know the dump and then we had the campsite then we had the farm so for those situations what I would do is I would get I would just look up <laughs> just random things on google so for skyline city I looked up you know New York um what San Francisco I looked at those kinds of places with huge just different skylines I looked up like cities in China I looked up all these like different types of places and it's weird because I didn't even like describe it that long but I need it I need to like look at references to get not only a feeling for how it looks but how I want to write it 
So it's like when I look at references for like Skyline City, I'm like, okay, this is how I want to work it into the descriptions. This is what I want it to look like. So this is what the skyscrapers, how tall they are and like the general mood of the city. Like it's so busy and loud that I tried to work that into the dialogue. So that's why Macaque is like, I hate this place. It's too loud. There's too many people. And and Wukong is constantly like, this place is huge. I don't want to be here. So like, that's why I thought that because I would look at these references for these huge cities and just how many people there were. And I was like, oh, that's how that looks horrible. <laughs> I don't like crowds. So I was like, that doesn't look great. All these people. So that's what I would do for the for like Skyline City for the dump. I just looked at dumps. I just looked at, you know, landfills, <laughs> you know, because I was like, I don't really know how to describe this. So I would just try my best. That's why there's not too much of a description there. Because I was like, I don't really, you know, it's not really that important this one time. You know, it's a landfill. You know, you know what I'm talking about when I say that. So, like, I don't have to, like, go deep into it. I think I tried a little bit, but not to the extent of, like, the farm. Um, the farm um, was, I got a lot of environmental references for because, and that's because it was, going to be like 10 different things I was going to write it 10 different ways and I kept changing my mind so I have all these like references of farms because I was like I want them to go to a farm but I don't know what kind of farm I want them to go to and I was like do I want them to go to an orchard do I want them to go to a grove do I want them to go to like you know rice farming and I was like you know what I really like rice farming so then I was looking at you know rice terraces and I was like oh I love the terraces of rice and how that's grown. So I would, I watched a whole bunch of videos about how to grow rice <laughs> and like, you know, how this is the right way to do it. And you don't want to do this. And you know, all that looked into rice production. <laughs> and then like, I looked at video games a lot. Um, there's, which ones did I look at? Um, I think I looked at Final Fantasy 14 because there's also like these places in there that have rice terraces. So I would look at, those areas and like look at how the terraces were drawn out how long they were and how much rice you could plant in each one I also looked at like Genshin Impact because they didn't have rice terraces at least in the part where I played I haven't played in Genshin in a long time I just played when it initially came out so I've only seen like the first two places but I remember there was these terraces that had like flowers and I was like do we want it to be rice terraces or do we want to do flowers because then we could have like lotus you know lotuses or something I was like trying to figure out what I wanted them to do I was like I just want them to be on a farm and have to do work for a lantern piece and I was like I need to figure out specifically what I want to do there and that took some time and I switched up the ideas a lot um initially they were supposed to like actually interact with the old man a little bit more they were going to trick him by coming up with this whole like backstory of you know MK being related to somebody in the in the village and he like needed to buy he like he was going to be like oh I dropped something in the fields and you know my grandma said that you found it you know that kind of thing then I switched that and I was like okay maybe they can just go up to him and bargain and I think I showed a part of that that's what I was going to have them do the second time then I was like, eh, you know what? I think they would try and just steal it <laughs> the first time if it's just out. I wanted to do that because, um, you know, the I wanted to like consider their powers. And then I was like thinking long term. Like things change a lot when you like have to think this is how it's going to play out and this is how it's going to end. And when I got closer to the ending, I was like, we need to go back and change the beginning because it doesn't make sense. So that's why it changed so many times. And that's why I did a lot of references for the farm because I was like oh they're not gonna plant they're gonna um harvest they were gonna harvest rice and then I was like that's a lot of descriptions that I don't have time for <laughs> so we're just gonna have them plant so I went back and forth about what was gonna happen there and then on the farm I was gonna have this there's so much I cut from the farm that I had to though because it was already so long I was going to have Wukong working and then Macaque like checking him out and then MK was gonna make an like say something like oh macaque has been looking at you for fucking <laughs> 30 minutes and wukong's like ha, you're funny that's not true like wukong is in such denial and i was gonna have that be a whole thing 
Like I had dialogue written already that I had to take it out. Um, that's a lot of the writing process is just taking things out and doing what's best overall for the fic or the novel or whatever. You have to kill so many good scenes and good dialogue. You just have to be okay with it. And it's really hard. That's the hardest part of writing is getting, just getting rid of those things that you want to be in there. Cause there's so many funny things, so many funny jokes I had that are gone. You know, all these interactions that I really liked that I had to get out, get rid of just for the betterment of the fic. And it's just really sad, but overall I'm pleased with what happened. I'm just sad because <laughs> there was a lot of cool jokes, but anyway, um, when and then when it came to environmental references for the inn, I did. Uh, I looked up some hotels. <laughs> I looked up some inns and hot springs and hotels in China, and then I looked around the area around them to just describe the mountains and the trees and the forest and just that whole feeling and that vibe of the cool air and the mist of the air. So I looked at that. I also looked at prices of the hotels and then competing hotels to like just help describe how I would like this one. This hotel is a little bit more homely and a little bit more modest compared to everything else. And, you know, just that I try and get as much information as I can just to help me get a picture of what I want and then to help with descriptions because I can put that into the descriptions. Like I can put that into the dialogue. I can put that into the introspection if I have like an idea of what I want and what I'm seeing because that kind of helps visually paint the picture. Like, I can describe it and then I can have Wukong mention something or I can describe it and then Macaque Macaque says something or notices something, you know, it just helps overall if you have like a tone in mind when you start. Um, Also with the stone forest, I looked up stone forests and I also looked at like hiking trails, mountains, um, all that kind of stuff to like do the pavilions, the pavilions in the middle of the just these abandoned pavilions <laughs> that have like moss growing on them and stuff. I love pavilions personally. And I thought I wanted to put one in there and I thought it would be cute if they sat in one. And that's why I put it in there. And that whole scene was actually not initially planned. The stone forest was going to go way different because the stone forest was not, was going to go before the farm. Actually, <laughs> this, this fic has changed so much. It's crazy to look back on it, but like it was going to be Skylon City, Stone Forest, then the farm, then the inn, but then I switched it. I switched it around because I had some issues with the days and like I'd have to write an extra night and I didn't want to do that. So um, for the campground scene, I just looked at camps. I, I have some of those references saved because I just write about camps and tents and stuff so often because you know, just other fandoms and stuff. So that's, that's kind of what I do. I just go on Google and I also just, when I find like an image in Google that shows what I want, I then like look specifically at that place and then I research that specific place. Then sometimes I look at like, like for chapter four, the alcove with the waterfall, I just looked up waterfalls and alcoves and then I just created what I wanted. Like sometimes what I want does not exist. So I can't, I don't have a direct reference that happens a lot. So I'm like, I find something that's as close as possible. And I just describe that as best as I can in a way that I hope is like, helps with the visual of it. Cause I'm like, I don't know if this looks, I'm describing how I think it looks. And I don't know if other readers will get it, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> like, so but I've gotten comments that they like the descriptions and visuals of it. So I'm like, I guess I'm doing something right. But I literally, literally, I just look at, at as much as possible just to get a tone in my head. And then I just write, I just write what I think and I describe it as best as I can. And that's what I do. Um, how long did it take to plot this fic? It took how, however long it, it took me to write it <laughs> because I'm, I had the basic premise of the fic figured out in April, maybe in March. And the basic premise was like, I want them to go on a scavenger hunt for lantern pieces. <laughs> Cause I thought that was such a good idea to get them stuck. And I knew that I wanted the last chapter to be, I wanted the last chapter to be them being stuck somewhere 
and just talking things out. And then from there, I was like, let's work on the backstory because there were things in season four. This is what everyone needs to understand. This probably should have been the first part of this whole thing because yeah, but there were things in season four that I didn't really agree with and that didn't make sense to me. I'm not saying that it was a bad season. There's obviously going to be like, this season's better, this season's worse. There were things in season four that just did not make logical sense to me. And I was like, I need to fix this. <laughs> so that's kind of where this fit came from. Um, one of the biggest ones was that uh, Wukong was the only one to be punished for, you know, rising up against heaven. Uh, I know that like they did that intentionally to work in the whole punishment from heaven, like the furnace and being imprisoned under the mountain. But it is so weird to me that no one else got punished after that initial uprising. Like, I'm not saying they didn't go to jail or whatever. It was just like weird that heaven let everyone else go and Wukong is imprisoned and they just let Wukong be imprisoned. You could, you could argue that it's because Wukong directly fought the emperor he the and my answer to that is the only reason he could do that is because the rest of the brotherhood were fighting off soldiers so this was a planned attack so i don't know i don't know why you know they just punished wukong and i was like i know that wukong later on in the journey sent azure and everyone else to hell and then he fought macaque so it's like they sent wukong to like clean up the mess and i'm like that's weird to me because i don't think that's in character of heaven which is weird. You're like, heaven isn't a character. Eh, it kind of is. They like make these decisions and stuff. You have to think, I have to think about it that way in order to like, you know, make it make sense within this world. I have to think of heaven and hell as a character to be like, especially since it's like a bureaucracy, they work in tandem. It's not like heaven versus hell or anything like that, which is another thing. I don't know if, I think they're going to try and do that for season five, this heaven versus hell type of thing. And I'm not really for that. But like, anyway, I, you have to think of them as like entities because they are and they have they make these decisions. And it's like weird. If, it's weird that they did not punish everybody and just Wukong because they could have done that. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know why they didn't. So that's why um, Macaque has this whole backstory. And that is also why in this AU, Azure and Yellow Tusk and Ping got sent to the scroll like Wukong got sent to the furnace and the mountain. Macaque got sent to hell and got severely punished because he tried to escape. The other three got sent to hell also, but they got imprisoned in the memory scroll to live out their, you know, mistakes and all that bullshit. So in this AU, Wukong did not hunt anybody down and do that. And someone had asked me, like, what does that mean for season four in Azure? It means that the relationship between Wukong and Azure is... A little bit well a lot different so you know I would be interested in writing that out but I don't know if I don't know when I would do that and the thing is is that from where constellations ends up to the season four first episode that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot of writing that I'd have to do between I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do that so like basically getting back to the point there was a lot of things in season four that I didn't like understand or agree with and didn't make sense to me so that's why this fic came about um also i just wanted to write about wukong doing a murder because i'm not trying to bash anybody here i'm not trying to be mean it's just like i would read some stuff and i'd be like i don't really like how that was resolved you know i wanted the i wanted their the problems between macaque and wukong to be deeper and for it to have a little bit more depth and i didn't want it to be solved immediately i didn't want it to be like okay now we're best friends again you know i don't you know i'm not i'm not for that it's it's and i know why people do that because it's hard to like stick to it and make them like not immediately kiss or just get good it takes discipline to do that as a writer it takes um patience and self-control <laughs> Cause I, everyone wants fluff, you know, and it's like, you work, you went through all this hard work to work, like write out an argument and resolve it. And you're like, well, now I want fluffy cuddles. And it's like, yeah, I understand that. And it's like, that's why I have to take breaks from writing this fic to write other things. It's like, I write established relationship shadow peach all the time. And I just have little bits and pieces here. That's like 
to help me go back to them not being at that point right now. And it's like, I understand why people do that, but it's just like, it's not realistic to me. So I'm like, I want a more realistic portrayal of that. And that's why this fic happened. You know, I just wanted to, I just wanted to see it. Plus I just had this AU where, you know, season three, things went a little bit differently. Cause I also didn't like in season four that they, um, you know, benched Wukong. I know why they have to, I know it's like they have to get Wukong out of the way. So MK can learn things or, you know, cause Monkey King can solve a whole bunch of stuff. Cause he's so powerful. Like I get it, but it was like really disappointing to me to be like season four is when Wukong is going to be a lot more honest with MK. And then we didn't get to see that till the special kind of like, I was like, that sucks. <laughs> Plus I didn't like that they cut Wukong in half and then that didn't lead to anything? Come on. Come on. I don't even know why they did that. I really don't. It bothers me. Anyway, <laughs> um, the last part of this ask was which idea came first? The first idea came from I want Wukong and Macaque to be, to have a real, I want, I okay, it came from I want Wukong to have done a murder. I want them to talk about it and have this big grudge between them. I want there to be more, have more depth to their backstory and why they have this anger towards each other. And I was like, how can I do that post season three? Cause I don't want to touch season four. <laughs> and that's how the, just remembering, like, I was like, how can I get them to go? The whole thing was like, how can I get them to work together to get, to go on an adventure? And I was like, what do they have in common? And I was like, the lantern. So that's how it came about. I was like, and then I, after I f saw that, I was like, the lantern, they could go get lantern pieces. Then I was like, we need someone to send them on this punishment, on this adventure. And I was like, what did Wukong do recently? <laughs> that could be a punishment. And I remembered he destroyed, you know, that palace, Najah's palace, and, t and took the map and caused all this destruction. Like, he destroyed that whole place. And it's like, okay, that, that could work, you know. So that's how it started. And, I, and then I was like, oh, this idea is too good for me not to write. But then I got nervous. I was like, this is a big undertaking and I don't know if I can do it. And now I'm on chapter five and I'm almost done. And I'm really glad that I did it. Um, I really like this fic. I like it a lot. <laughs> so I'm really glad that I did it. And I'm really glad people like it and that they have been telling me that they like it because I appreciate that. Um, so that's that's it for that question. <laughs> Now for the next one I have, um, basically this question is how do Canon and Constellations AU, Macaque and Wukong differ in personality and opinions? And they gave an example, like while both Macaques are obviously angry and vengeful at Wukong, your Mac, your Macaque seems a little bit more of that. Oh, okay. So how do they differ? Okay, well, Macaque is more vengeful about it because as we talked about before, he has that, you know, linger, lingerly, lingering sense of abandonment due to the whole torture situation. So he is very angry and he is very vengeful because he has those two things on top of it. And it's like just, you know, being tortured and having to go through that when you're like, my mate could have saved me, but he didn't, you know, that really fucks him up so he is really he's obviously more angry about it than you know canon macaque is canon macaque and it's like we don't know what the whole story between canon macaque and wukong so it's a little unfair to compare because it's like we don't know what all happened there but it's like just looking at what happened so far in season four it doesn't feel like it's going to be like as deep you know it's going to be like it's not going to be surface level but it's not going to be going to be as deep as it could have been you know um, cause I, I really don't think they're going to go with Wukong actually killed Macaque in canon. Um, so that's why I wanted to write a situation where he did, cause I just think that's more interesting. Um, so I think that in canon, Macaque's angry at Wukong because he just isn't as angry because it wasn't as serious an issue. You know, it wasn't as deep of an issue. Like he felt abandoned. He thinks Wukong killed him. Um, and that's it. Like he wasn't tortured, you know, you know, he was punished. So he kind of got to go off scot-free and he left Wukong, you know, under that mountain. So <laughs> we have that going on. Um, and then, so I think that, I think that the difference is that 
Constellation's mechanic just had a lot more suffering. So he has a lot more to be angry at Wukong for, and he has a lot to be angry at the world for. He has a lot to be angry at hell for. He's just angry. He's hurt. He's hurt more than Canon Macaque is. Uh, so that's why he's a bit more vengeful and angry because of the, the series of events that happened and how they affected him and how they continue to affect him because he's still cursed. Like you have to remember, he is still cursed and has been. He has, a, like, the only time he has known true peace, which is sad as fuck, is when he was dead. Like, every, ever since that uprising against the emperor, he has been cursed. So he's been haunted every night. And that's fucked up. So yeah, he's angry. <laughs> you know, just from that, that would piss me off. <laughs> but yeah, so that's why he's like, you know, more angry about it. He's also, um, out of there, uh different personalities i'm trying to think about some more personality differences between canon mac and constellations um i think i think i made constellations macaque a bit more like i don't know i think i made him more reserved you know canon macaque just makes jokes and jabs all the time he's laughing all the time holy shit he's constantly laughing um and i kind of did that with constellations in having macaque shadow magic and his clones laugh a lot every time he like puts his shadow magic out into the world they're laughing and cackling and stuff but he himself isn't laughing that's the that's a big difference like canon macaque will be laughing at you constellations macaque will make the world laugh at you so it's not just one person it's everybody it makes you feel like it's kind of like a surround sound of like being rude and mean and like mocking it's just this mocking nature that he puts into his magic to like further torture people or make them uncomfortable i really like that part because he did it macaque canon macaque did it sometimes and i just wanted to do that every time because i think it's cool um also um uh, constellations macaque is uh not i don't want to say more threatening power wise i mean threatening like he will get in your face and threaten you with pain like he will threaten you <laughs> he has threat he threatened wukong like four times <laughs> in three chapters <laughs> so he is not afraid of doing that um he also is the thing is is that i took the thing is with these difference in personality opinions i took canon macaque and just built off of that and i tried to like ground him a little bit more if you take because when you look at the universe of lego monkey kid you're like okay i can see what is here because it's a kid show i can see what's here because they're trying to sell toys i can see what's here because of you know the writing style you know all that kind of stuff so when you take an au and it's canon divergent you're trying to match as close to canon as you can but you're trying to make it more realistic so it's like I built off of Canon Macaque and then added this depth to him to make him more complex and put him in a realistic context that is not hindered by like, you know, mandates and, you know, television and all that kind of stuff. And it's a kid's show, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so the writing is a bit more complex and he's written a bit more com complex as a result as as a result of that. So he they like. uh they're, they're similar, but, you know, the differences are all going to be linked to that complexity because it's like, what different opinions do they have? Um, one of them is that Macaque is not fond of heaven or hell. Um, he, you know, Wukong kind of like keeps his head down. Macaque literally hates both of them. <laughs> uh, but how he handles that will be revealed. He just, he will just tell you he is not fond of either of them. He's not about it. Wukong isn't either, but he's like keeping his head down. He's not trying to aggravate. Macaque isn't either, but he just fucking can't stand them. Um, but I feel like I'm talking about Macaque a lot. Wukong, the difference here is that I kind of, you know, in canon, whew, Wukong in canon is just a big can of worms, but, you know, he is more... Uh, He's just silly. I mean, he, he's silly in constellations, but in a different way. And in canon, Wukong is like, he just feels really like absent-minded. <laughs> he just seems really like 
scatterbrained to me. Like he has so much going on. He's so laid back, you know. And, you know, in Constellations, Wukong isn't as, I mean, he's laid back, but when it's like time to like, when he's, when it's a mission, when there's a goal, when they have to do something, he's kind of like got that on the brain. But we also have to understand that in canon, Wukong presents himself a certain way, but that's not how he is, you know, really, truly, because, and we get hints of that, like when he was looking at MK's drawings with the companions and like whole thing with the samadhi fire like he is not good with plans he's not good at like thinking forward he's not good with those kinds of things but he has a depth to him that is like sentimental he cares about people he pushes people away he doesn't want anyone to get hurt he's willing to sacrifice himself he doesn't he will take on the burden he will take on the responsibility if it means that other people don't get hurt he will do that he will put himself forward and, you know, that's something he has in common with Constellations because Wukong was, like, willing to do this whole journey by himself. Um, and, you know, just how he protects MK a lot during this whole journey in Constellations, how he, like, literally tries and makes sure, tries to make sure MK is okay. Fails a few times, but he's trying. And that'll, it'll be shown in Chapter 5 a lot how far Wukong is willing to go for somebody uh, because he will shoulder the burden. He will, f he's, I feel like he's kind of a fixer. You know, he tries to be, he tries to fix things. And sometimes when trying to fix things, he makes things worse, you know, but you know, he has good intentions. He just fucks up a lot. <laughs> he just doesn't have that, you know, forethought, which Bacac does, which is why they work better together. But anyway, like those types of things, you know, these hints of canon Wukong, having this this depth i think he's just really thoughtful he's scatterbrained but he's thoughtful when it comes to like oh just anything with memories anything that reminds him of like how things used to be i think he's just really like secluded himself he's like detached himself from a lot of things just to protect himself as a defense mechanism you know constellations wukong also does that how he like puts distance between mk and his friends to like be like I'm not going to acknowledge that they're descendants because that will hurt me. And he says that it hurts too much. Even now, years, thousands of years later, it hurts him still. So, you know, I try and keep those core things the same, like the abandonment in Mekai, the pushing people away in Wukong, the um, logical, thought, clever, driven way of thinking from Mekai, the forgetfulness, the sloppy planning in Wukong, that kind of stuff. I try and keep those things the same. Um, but yeah, if they seem, if Constellation seems like, oh, your Wukong is a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that, you kind of have to take everything in their backstories into account because, you know, that's important. I think when we also think about like canon personalities and opinions, you know, what are we like what are we thinking when we consider that like what are we you know because when we look at canon you know everybody's influenced by fan fanon at some point you know they those types of things enter your brain and they don't really leave i mean some of it might leave but you know that has a that has a uh, influence also on like on your interpretation of canon because people have different interpretations of canon so it's like, your canon Wukong is going to be different from so-and-so's. Maybe your canon Wukong is different from mine. I don't, like, I, I don't know. But it's, you know, it's that kind of thinking. And then it's like that, your interpretation that you think is canon influences, you know, how you interact with fandom, what you think is right, what you think is correct, what's wrong, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, when you look at canon, are you seeing... What do you see when you look at the characters? Like, what do you notice? What do you notice? And what do you take notice of? What do you think is you is is you reaching to, towards something that may or may not be true? Like, you're, like, really reaching for something. And then what is, you know, fact? You know, the differences between that. That's kind of like what I was talking about with an Anon last night, this morning, where they were talking about you know how people interpret the different characters and how they focus on some things and not other things um 
you know, every character is affected by that. And every character has to suffer through that, you know, just being passed off around uh, multiple people's hands, they're going to change an in interpretation. So it's like, there are things in constellations that I inferred from canon that I, I like, I looked into a piece of dialogue and I was like, oh, this is what this person could have meant, or this is what this situation was about, or this says a lot about how, since how they handled this situation says a lot about their personality and how they would deal with confrontation and like those types of things you have to like because because even though there's a lot of material here to work with I'm so used to doing that because in other fandoms there's not I haven't had a lot of material to work with so I've had to like reach for stuff and yoink it out to make it like to characterize it so it's like with Lego Monkey Kid there's a lot more to work with which is why the different interpretations to me are like oh why how did you get there <laughs> But, you know, I'm not going to hate on anybody. That's what fandom is for, is all these different interpretations. It's just like, it's just wildly different, you know. And that's why, you know, MK is a really great example of this because I have, he's the protagonist, so he's going to have all these different interpretations and people that's going to influence fic and fan art and all these types of things, all the headcanons all the things that become popular because somebody said something or, you know, they made some connection. It's going to influence him the most because he's the, and, you know, other popular characters like Wukong and Macat, you know, those three are the ones that are going to be the most affected. So it's like, you know, it's, it's reaching deep into a character and pulling things out of their personality and giving them light, I think, is is part of the characterization and the inter interpretation because it's like MK has so much going on that I don't think a lot of people realize. And I try and work that into this fic, which is not even from his perspective. <laughs> and I'm like, but you know, you can use dialogue and you can use conversations to develop a character who is not the central character, which is something that I wish more people would do, not just in this fandom. I'm not even talking about in this fandom. I mean, like in media, in, inter in the entertainment industry, I wish people would make use of that device of using other people because then you can develop two characters at once. You know, it's just like they don't they don't have the right like scenes or they don't have the right plot or they don't have the right conflict to do it. And it's like so some characters seem really surface level and like not as developed as other ones because they can't like think of ways to put two characters together or three characters together and like have them have an argument or work something out or drive the plot together, you know? So that's why I really wanted conversations between MK and Wukong and MK and Macaque because I wanted to also develop their individual relationships because those are also important. And I also wanted to say, or like just show that MK is important to both of them. And that's why he has these really emotional conversations. Like that's like, that's what I've, gotten the second most <laughs> in all the comments is like oh I love all the sunburst duo moments or all the soy sauce duo why is it soy sauce anyway I like all the soy sauce duo moments and I'm like well yeah because MK is integral to both of them but it's like even if he wasn't like a primate he still would be like it's he's just important to them and they care about him a lot and they show it you know they they show it and they could be better <laughs> about showing it macaque but like they're trying is what i wanted basically to say is that they are trying their best that's all they can do and and you know the, it's just when it comes and i don't want people to think that i put mk there just to like just to oh it's i don't want people to think oh in constellations mk is just there to like give wukong the idea to talk to macaque about it you know, you can make that argument. You could make the argument that I put MK there to be like, oh, that's how Wukong figures out how to find the lantern pieces. Sure, you can sit there and say that, but MK has a lot of development in this fic. Just from the beginning to where we are now, he has a lot of development. Because when you go back to chapter one and you read how MK was and how he talked to Macaque and how he talked to Wukong, how he thought of Wukong, and you go to chapter four now and you hear him say like, 
I want to know who you are. I want to see who you are. I want you to tell me the truth. And then I'm going to make a decision. Like, I just think that is a whole bunch of growth. And his freaking relationship with Macaac has gone up and down and up and down. And I think in this fic, it's just really beautiful how at the end, they do grow to trust each other. And I think every conversation with Macaac and MK is important. And it's just, I mean, every conversation with MK is important, but it's just like, he's got his own stuff going on. Like he's learning that Wukong like pays attention to the things he likes and that Wukong sees him as a friend and it's, their relationship is not just teacher and student or mentor and mentee. It's, that's not all that their relationship is. They're friends and like friends, you know, hang out and do, and do stuff together. Like they're friends. So it's like MK also learning about that is important. And then him extending that friendship to Macaque is also important because Macaque is just going to sit there and not do anything. He's just, he's not going to extend that same olive branch. He's not going to be like, oh, we're friends. He's not going to do that. But MK is. So you could say, you could argue that MK is only included just to give Wukong the idea. But also, I don't think that's true. I think MK is included because he has compassion and heart and he gets these dumb monkeys to see how important connections are and how they're worth fighting for. And I think that's just, I personally think that's beautiful, but I also think that speaks to MK's character a lot. And it goes hand in hand with Canon and how he has always been the one to be like, we are only going to do this if we work together. If we do things together, we can do it. And he has never been wrong. And it's like, people can't argue about that. Like McCat couldn't argue in the face of that. He couldn't be like, oh, MK's wrong about this. He wasn't. He was right. And that's kind of why MK said, like, well, I was right about beating the Lady Bone Demon, so maybe you should trust me about this. Like, you know, it's kind of like he figured out what logically would make sense to Macaque, and he's using that to, like, get him to understand. Like, that's also what's important. This... We're, MK is figuring out how to interact with his mentors, like both of them. He's figuring out how to communicate to each of them, just like they're learning how to communicate to him. He is learning how to talk to Macaque and what Macaque values and how he can get through to Macaque and how he can like get their relationship to a good point. And he's learning how to better communicate with Wukong now that he has more um, context as to what their relationship is. Because he's, you know, at the beginning, he was like, oh, Monkey King's awesome. You know, he can, he's amazing. He can do all this stuff. And now he's like, Monkey King is a flawed person and he made mistakes, but he isn't a monster. He's trying to do better. And I just want to learn everything about him. And I'm just going to discern things for myself. You know, I just think that's important. And I just wanted to convey that because MK is like, it's also out of spite because I do really like MK and I think he's like a really good protagonist. And like, I think he has a lot of complexity and depth to him and I really wanted to like dive into that. But this is like a Shadow Peach fic. <laughs> so I was like, how can I do that? and work on both his relationship with Macaque and Wukong and like do that in a way that is like satisfying but doesn't get in the way of what's, like it's not gonna get in the way but it doesn't take up too much time and the pacing of the fic, because it's like, you know, the pacing is super important. I know all the chapters are long and people just eat that shit up, you know, as soon as it comes out. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, people just tear into it and then <laughs> they're done. But the pacing of it, even from chapter to chapter, is like really important. Um, so like planning out which scenes are going to be dedicated and how long each scene is. I have to look at the word length of each scene because it's like the like I can tell you the word counts because <laughs> that's how weird I am. The conversation with Wukong and MK was like 2,000, 3,000 words. The conversation with MK and Macaque was 2,000 words, 2,500 maybe. The fight scene was I think 5,000, 6,000. Then the mirror was 12,000 words. Then everything else was, I don't know, 7,000. I stopped counting after the mirror. I was like, we need to get the mirror down to a certain... Not that I'm doing this by word count, but I use the word count to help with pacing. Because if it's like, I know how short and how long something is. Because I was like, 
the mirror scene has to be satisfying. So I was like, it can't be like five, 6,000 words. It needs to be lengthy. So that's where the 34K comes from is the mirror scene is a fic all by itself because it's 12,000 words. But it needed to be 12,000 words to be satisfying. So that is why. Um, but yeah, the whole, the whole conversations with MK, I also have to measure out. And I did that with every single chapter because I'm like, I can't, I have to be conscious of how much time is dedicated to this and where I want it to go moving forward. So that is all, that is also what I did. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff that I wish I could have done, dived into more and like talked about. There's a lot of stuff in these conversations that I wish I could have like explored. Like I really wanted to, the the conversation between Macaque and MK in front of the end to be longer because I wanted MK to talk about the trustworthiness of them both and all that and just dive into everything that happened. I wanted him to talk about that more, but I was like, we have to get going and also that was, I think, it's so funny because the mirror scene was hard to write, kind of. It was actually the the moments between Wukong and MK and Macaque and MK that were harder. I spent a lot of time on those and I would honestly write something and then move on to something else and then come back and rewrite it and take stuff off because it's like that's the dialogue in there was was. And it was hard. That was hard to write. And you're like, why? I'm like, I don't know. I don't... It's just like, I wasn't, I had a really hard time because chapter three ended really strongly to me. It ended in this way where we were at this really low point. And I, as a writer, struggle at that point. Like I have no problem, I think. I'm not trying to be arrogant. This is just what I think. And I could be wrong. But I'm like, I don't think I have a problem with getting to that low point. It's picking that low point back up. That's difficult for me. So that's why chapter four was hard because, and that why those first two scenes were hard because that's what I was doing. I was picking us up from that low point and trying to pull us up to a point where we could go to the mirror arc. And that was really difficult because the dialogue had to be really intentional because in the beginning, I wasn't going to have MK like, I was going to have him be like, oh, everything's fine. And I was like, well, that's out of character. And then I was going to be like, oh, everything's kind of fine. Like I kept going back and forth on how I wanted MK to react to this news. And I had to like move on and like really think about it to get to a good point. And that just, that took the most amount of time, honestly, was just those two interactions. The mirror scene was not hard to write. <laughs> I mean, it was hard at times. But it was not hard to write overall because I had written a lot of it before. I've written a lot of it while writing chapter two. I write out of order. So um, I would work on chapter four while working on chapter two. And then I would finish chapter two first and post it. Then chapter four would have 5,000 words already of like certain scenes or just ideas or dialogue. And then I would get to that chapter and I would refine them and take them out or put more in and that kind of stuff. So the mirror scene was like literally halfway already written when I actually got to working on chapter four, it was already halfway. So what I did was I would like look at what I had and then link it, like write out how to get there, make transitions between dialogue and like subjects and then like try and match things up kind of like putting a puzzle piece together. That's what I would do because I wrote, I wrote out of order. And I do that because I get inspiration for scenes that I'm not at. So like in chapter two, a lot. And in chapter three, a lot, especially like I, I started working on the chapter at, I started working on the mirror scene in earnest during chapter three when, was it chapter three or chapter two? Chapter two, whenever they were at the farm and they had that argument, I started working on chapter four in earnest and trying to nail those emotions because I was already dealing with those same emotions. So I was like, let me work on chapter four because I have I already have ideas of how I want that to go. And that just helps me with my motivation and stuff to just, you know, get things out of there. Like it's the same with chapter five. Chapter five already has like 5,000 words in it. But 
because of, but it also doesn't account for like how things change because chapter four ended in a way that I didn't, I didn't plan on it ending in that way. <laughs> I came up with that like maybe two days before I posted it. And I was like, if we do this, we're going to have to change a lot of how chapter five works. And I was like, well, I guess that's what we're going to do because I like this ending. So like, that's what I have to do now. So that's why I've kind of just been taking a break because uh, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with chapter five because this is unplanned stuff that I have to like, not, I don't want to say it's unplanned. It was planned. I just have to change the way that it happens now. So it's like I have to, you know, adjust. <laughs> And it's like, that's, that takes time to figure out and to make it feel seamless and, and, and good and cathartic. I have to dedicate time to doing that. So that's why I'm taking a break. Not that I haven't been working on chapter five. I have, but you know, it's most, I've mostly been working on the epilogue because it's like, I, I know I've talked about it. That's from Macaque's perspective and it, it is, that was not planned. So I'm basically reworking the epilogue also <laughs> because it was going to be from Wukong's perspective. And I was like, that's really smart. That'll be a nice way to close it out. But then I was thinking about it and I was like, I think it would be more interesting if it was from Macaque's perspective, even if that like changes the tone, the tonal ending of it. I think that would be more interesting overall. Because um, technically chapter five is the end of the fic. Like that's it. <laughs> so the epilogue is just a bonus um and it the epilogue doesn't have to be there i mean because people i don't want people to think i don't want people to think you know chapter five is going to fix everything it's not you know there's going to still be questions and it's like i don't know how, how many times have you read like a novel recently where everything was fixed like at the end, like a standalone novel. I've been reading a lot of standalone novels and I still had like questions at the end. And I was like, you know what? It's not, the author doesn't have to reveal everything to me because they don't. Sometimes you have to like pick up the slack. <laughs> I mean, or I mean, if it's not it's deeply important, you know, or maybe if it is deeply important, maybe that's what, the author wants you to figure like if that's important to you they want you to like solve it or like think about it or come to your own conclusions and there's a there's going to be something that isn't resolved in chapter five that i think people will get mad at me about because they're like why didn't you resolve this and i'm like well this is what i think this is what because i feel like i need to stop talking this is what i want people to leave this podcast thingy with this fix started as Wukong like having to collect these artifacts as punishment. It ends when he turns those back in. Like when his punishment is done, it, it's over. Anything else that cropped up during the time of this trip, anything else, any other plot, anything else like that that happened and came to light, that's not that's not the initial premise or plot of this fic the plot of the fic was i have to go find these three artifacts and return them as soon as he does that the fic is over you know because we solved the initial plot we're done so anything that comes after is going to be a sequel or it's bonus content you know that's why the epilogue is bonus because it doesn't have to do with the punishment it doesn't have to do with the three things it's just bonus for me personally so I, you know, this is kind of my way of saying there's going to be a sequel. I don't know if I'm going to write it or when I can tell you what happens because I don't, I really don't know if I'm going to have time to do it, but it's like, there's going to be unresolved things, but the central plot is going, is resolved, you know? And I feel like the, the, the ending of that central plot is satisfying. Other things will probably not be satisfying to people. And I'm sorry, but like, I, I, that's not what this was about, you know? And I feel, I feel kind of bad because I don't have that kind of like, oh, why, I don't like that you didn't solve this. Why is this still, this hanging plot thread is still here and you're not working on it. I don't have that kind of like 
anxiety about it. I don't have any anxiety about it because I already know what's going to happen. I already, I've already planned it out. Everything's resolved to me. So I don't, I, I'm not able to empathize with that feeling. I feel bad because I'm not able to, but I understand why people would feel that way. I understand people will feel that way, but I just don't have that same anxiety and like nervousness when it comes to like plot threads or things like that. Cause I, I already know, like, I don't like the thing is is that I've really planned this AU a lot because I love I like this AU a lot I like what I did with it and I like the backstories that I made up and I like the magic system and everything so I've kind of just been hang I've been hanging out in this AU for a really long time and I've just come up with all these like solutions and like this is how this would work out and this is how this would go and this is what happens next and this is what happens after that you know I already have like this general timeline of how things happen in my brain so it's like I don't that that hanging plot thread is not a concern to me but when I'm when I take myself out of that I'm like I think overall this is better I think it's satisfying to me at least and I mean I'm the one writing it and I'm sorry if we get to five and people don't feel satisfied um maybe the epilogue will help <laughs> Maybe the epilogue will help ease some of that pain. Hopefully. I don't want I don't want to be like morbid or like I don't want people to be dreading it. It's gonna end nicely. There just might be some things where you're like, oh, what happened there? Yeah. And I just want people to know that that's intentional. Because anything that happens next has to be like a whole other premise, you know? It has to be something else. Like we have to create something else and turn it into its own thing you know like it has to be a sequel it has to be we can't keep going <laughs> we can't keep like adding chapters to the constellations within us because the whole summary that's a good way to look at it if the summary if the summary is complete like what happened in the summary is solved then it's over i just want people to keep that in mind if you don't mind doing that um but yeah, so I hope people are looking forward to chapter five. I don't know when that's going to come out. <laughs> um, I have bare bones word count. It's like at 5,000. There is not a lot going on. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to get it out. Maybe October, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to have a busy time at work, so maybe not. I'm going to try, though. I'm going to try and finish this entire thing this year. If I can do that, I'll be so happy. But like... That's what I'm aiming at. Um, so I hope people are excited for chapter five and the epilogue. I'm super excited for both of those things. Um, I think those are all the questions. Those are all the questions I got for this particular podcast. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to talk about. Oh, we can talk about, before I end this, I know it's been like an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, before I end this, um, the whole guessing about who Macaque was trying to contact in the mirror, I don't think anyone is going to get that. <laughs> uh, I think I replied to one comment or made a post or something. I cannot foreshadow that as well. Because since this fic is in Wukong's perspective and he doesn't know, I can't foreshadow it. I can't foreshadow, you know, I mean, I could, but again, it's in Wukong's perspective. If it was in Macaque's perspective, you know, he'd know who it was. Um, but it isn't a celestial primate. Uh, it's someone that you probably wouldn't think. <laughs> I mean, you probably could but I haven't given any hints. So it's kind of like a shot in the dark if you guess it, you know, but it's a character from the show, of course. And it's someone we've seen and know. Um, like it's not an original character. That's not what, that's what I'm trying to say. It's someone from the show. Um, also, uh, Little Star. Yeah, there were some questions about her, them, sorry. Well, her pronouns are she, they. Um, so there were some questions about them and just who they are. And they're the, they're the third celestial primate born from embers uh, with the power of the stars. 
and the epilogue will go into that a little bit more. I just name drop them in chapter four because if I didn't, it would be weird. <laughs> if I didn't have Macag say it, it would be weird. The reason why Wukong did not ever say Little Star's name is because of what happened to, to them. And uh, there's a reason for why he's like, it's kind of the same reason why he doesn't call May by her name or Sandy by his name. You know, it's kind of a dis it's creating a distance type of thing to alleviate that hurt. So it's the same thing with Little Star where he doesn't outright say Little Star's name. He says Embers, he says Stars, and he says all these other things alluding to Little Star without saying their name. And I just think that's something that he would do even in his brain. That's how committed he is to this like defense coping mechanism where he's like I'm not attached to this person <laughs> I don't really you know that's also why um he calls macaque macaque instead of his real name that's also why he does that to create distance you know but as soon as he's able to he just switches back as soon it's so fucking funny anyway that's why and yeah I was talking about Little Star. So yes, they are the third celestial primate and they are made from, born from embers. And they're the third one. I had questions about MK. He is the fourth celestial primate. He's born from soil. Um, What other questions did were had? Oh, there were questions about, you know, people were like, oh, are you going to go into what happened to MK when he was born and where did he go? How did he end up? Like Macaque was asking at the end, like, how did he get off the mountain? Um, that whole thing is really kind of like, again, it is not the central plot of Constellations. Um, it's just, I can't not have them talk about it, you know, because if I didn't have them, like it's, it's foreshadowing. If I ever get to a point where that is written, then you'll know where it started. But I can't have them not talk about it because they both know. So it's kind of one of those situations where it'd be disingenuous if they didn't like discuss it. Uh, so the whole where did MK, how did MK get off of the mountain? That's um, something I'm, I, I know about and I have planned it, but you know, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> So I'm not going to, I think I've answered vaguely to comments talking about that. Uh, so we just need to know that he got, he's, he didn't, he wasn't raised on the mountain. And I think that's what we need to just know going forward. <laughs> that's what we need to know. And we need to know that little star is missing, is MIA. Where are they? I've got a lot of questions asking, are they okay? Are they alive? Ah! <laughs> Maybe we'll see. Maybe the epilogue will help us out. Maybe, you know, maybe Macaque will figure all this out. You know, we're, we we are in Wukong's perspective. And Wukong's a little bit of an idiot. A little bit. They're both stupid. Um, But, like, you know, Wukong is, like, not... The things that he thinks about, you know, are intentional. Like, it's intentional. He intentionally doesn't give much thought to these people. Like, that's intentional. He's trying to protect himself. He doesn't want to, like dive into that so maybe macaque who is more logical and is you know is still emotional but maybe he's more open to talking about these things maybe we'll get some more like depth in the epilogue that's why i'm like the epilogue is important too it's just not part of the central plot that's why it's an epilogue um but to end things because I've been talking too long. I just want to thank everyone again for reading and for also commenting and sharing your thoughts and theories and um, ideas and um, everything you noticed and everything that spoke to you. I really appreciate all those comments and all the tags and everything. I appreciate all the engagement and all the questions and all the, um, like everything regarding that I really appreciate so if you could you know keep sharing the fic and just you know keep sharing your thoughts with me if you want to and if you're comfortable with it um I appreciate that and I appreciate you listening to this and I appreciate the people who like expressed interest in it because I really didn't think anybody would um and I hope I 
covered all the questions. I did everything that's in my inbox, I'm pretty sure, and that I talked about recently. So, yeah, thank you again for everything. And looking forward to Chapter 5 in the epilogue. And then we'll be finished. And that's exciting. But thank you, guys. Thank you for listening.